loving God, we thank you for your son Jesus, that through his passion, death, and resurrection, he is the bridegroom of the church, that we, the baptized people, are his bride. We ask you to help us to understand that spousal union and how the sacrament of marriage makes that visible and helps us to encounter Christ our Lord, who is our bridegroom. For we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll go His computer will be up tomorrow. It has crashed for three weeks now? Oh, it's crashed for ten days. Ten days. <laughs> Two weeks. Almost two weeks. Anyway. Well, tonight's class is chapter 21 of the Catechism, uh, and we're speaking about the sacrament of, of marriage. Now, as you know, hopefully by now, the sacrament of marriage, uh, not the sacrament, sacraments in general are outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace, to, to bestow God's grace upon us. And all of the sacraments of the church are rooted in the ministry of Jesus, whether or not he explicitly uh, designed the sacrament or called it a sacrament. Each and every sacrament is rooted in the public ministry of Jesus, and after the resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the church um, developed all seven sacraments based upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit, first of all, but also looking back to what Jesus did and making his public ministry visible within the context of the, the church in the present. So that's very important to keep in mind, that, that the sacraments all have their roots in Jesus Christ and his public ministry, whether or not we can say he explicitly um, uh, instituted every sacrament in a specific way and gave a specific ceremony. No, we can't say that. But we can certainly say that in his public ministry he, he raised certain things to a, a level of a sacrament. Now when it comes to baptism, uh, that obviously makes visible uh, what Jesus has accomplished for us through his passion, death, and resurrection. That he washes us clean of actual and original sin. Um, the sacrament of confirmation symbolizes or, or makes visible uh, and tangible the giving of the Spirit uh, to each individual believer. Uh, Holy Communion, the bread and wine, uh, is a sign of the one sacrifice of Christ represented at the altar and how Jesus becomes food for our nourishment and for our salvation unto life everlasting. Uh, the two sacraments of healing are penance or confession, also known as reconciliation, and uh, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick or the sacrament of healing as well. We know that Jesus forgave sins. That was the crux of his ministry. Uh, and so the church um, manifests that in a continuing way through the sacrament of penance. We know that he healed people of their maladies. The sacrament of the anointing of the sick uh, manifests that in a sacramental way. And we also know that he called uh, 12 men to be his apostles, the very beginning of uh, the order of bishops of holy orders, and he actually established holy orders or the priesthood at the Last Supper. And we also know that he raised marriage to a new dignity. Obviously, it existed before his public ministry, but the, that um, he becomes for us uh, he teaches us, first of all, about the, the, not only the dignity of marriage uh, and that it can be a, a, a sign of uh, eternal life, the eternal banquet of heaven, the wedding feast of heaven, but it, he also gave a, a new permanence to it that had not existed uh, in the uh, Old Testament times. So we'll talk about that in tonight's class. So those are some of the, the um, in a nutshell, what the sacraments of the church are. Now when it comes to marriage, the sacrament of marriage in particular, but marriage in general, today the Catholic Church is going against the grain of popular culture and also what uh, our American culture or our world culture says that marriage ought to be. We are counter-cultural. We're in a church today and living in a culture today that is not supportive of the church. And rather than adapting to the culture, the church is now taking a counter-cultural perspective and reiterating what we believe to be the truth, whether or not it conforms to what 
the culture understands. And this is not only in the area of marriage, but in a number of other areas as well. So if it's important for us to understand that. We live in a culture today that is becoming more and more hostile to Christianity in general and Catholicism in particular. Because Catholicism in particular does not teach what the culture is teaching about human sexuality, about uh, abortion, about contraception, about um, stem cell research, about all of these issues the Catholic Church is taking a position that is alien to the direction that the culture is going. So we live in a countercultural time. But really we have always, uh, except when we lived in a period of time called Christendom. Uh, but then that brought its own uh, problems as well. But in terms of marriage, the Catholic Church has always understood marriage to be between one man and one woman and for a lifetime. Okay? that if you uh, were to separate from your spouse you could not then again get married again or if the culture allowed for a legal divorce you could not get married again uh, in the Catholic Church because you in the eyes of the church you were still married to the spouse that you had made your vows to until death do you part and so when our culture began to allow for divorce uh, the church reacted against that and reiterated the permanence of marriage we couldn't stop uh, the political aspect of our culture from establishing laws for divorce. But the church tried to fight that uh, in Europe, in Italy, uh, and in other places. And now, obviously, um, divorce is very commonplace today and, and instantaneous. Uh, and that in and of itself has had a detrimental uh, impact on marriage as we understand it uh, given to us from God. So I'd say that that would be one of the, the primary things. The other thing is um, what is occurring in terms of same-sex unions. Uh, this is a direct attack on, on what Jews and Muslims and, and uh, Christians believe about the nature of marriage in terms of, of orthodox belief, that it must be between one man and one woman. And so, we're now fighting the culture and the political system that is trying to change the definition of marriage. And that's creating some, some issues for us as well as Catholics. But as Catholics, we have a very lofty understanding about marriage as well as human sexuality. And both are based upon natural law, divine law, and certainly um, church uh, dogma and doctrine. We see marriage as ordained by God with a God-given purpose that predates the Christian understanding of marriage. It goes back all the way to Adam and Eve, our understanding of marriage as ordained or created by God. And we see um, sacramental, as, sacramental marriage as a lifetime uh, vocation until one of the spouses dies. Uh, and so that's that right there, those three things um, go directly against what our uh, secular culture is trying to do in terms of redefining marriage. So let's talk a little bit about marriage as a sacrament. As I mentioned, you've already learned that a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give God's grace, to reveal through signs and symbols the hidden presence of our risen Lord. And there are seven sacraments which I just went over. Baptism, Confirmation, Holy Eucharist, which are the sacraments of initiation and, and uh, life in Christ. Reconciliation or penance, confession, as well as anointing of the sick, which are the sacraments of healing. And then the sacraments of service and witness are holy orders and marriage. Now, in order to understand a sacrament, we have to understand the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, his public ministry. He was not a one-man show. He invited people to be his followers. He initiated them into his community of believers. That's linked to baptism. He gave them his power and authority, commissioned them, if you will, to go out to the world with the good news. That could be linked uh, to confirmation. He shared intimate moments with people by having meals with them. And he used the most sacred meal of the Jewish tradition uh, that of the Passover to be the memorial by which we would recall his passion, death, and resurrection, what we would call the Paschal Mystery, and make present his body and blood, which brings salvation to the world. 
what is called the Holy Eucharist. He forgave sins, penance. He healed the sick, anointing of the sick. He commissioned his apostles to go out into the world to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he ordained them at the Last Supper, holy orders. And he raised marriage to a new dignity at the wedding feast of Cana. In fact, that's the very first miracle that Jesus performs in his public ministry when you read the Gospel of John. Uh, um, changing water into the finest of wine at the end of a very elaborate wedding uh, reception or wedding banquet. And there's no accident in that. St. John's Gospel is making the point that because Jesus did this at a wedding feast, that he was elevating uh, not only marriage, the marriage of this couple that he attended and was at the reception, to uh, a sign of the relationship of Christ to the church. And that there is a link to that and the wedding banquet, what we would call the eternal wedding banquet. The other thing that Jesus did uh, in his public ministry was to re redefine the permanence of marriage. People say, theologians, that um, Jesus only changed two things within Jewish law that were permitted in Jewish law. Uh, the first <clears throat> was an eye for an eye. He did away with that and said, you know, go the extra mile, uh, turn the other cheek, give your coat, uh, uh, that sort of thing. And the second was uh, the Jew what Moses allowed in terms of a liberal understanding of how a man could divorce his wife. Uh, the apostles come up to Jesus and say, say to him, you know, Moses allowed us to divorce our wives. What do you say? <clears throat> and he says, well, Moses did that because of your hardness of heart. But it was not like that from the beginning. And then he gives a new teaching. He says to them, Whoever, whatever man divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever, uh, whatever woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so he raised, changed a, a, a principle of Mosaic law that was more liberal in allowing divorce and raised it to a new level. Uh, and, and, and the Catholic Church has taken that seriously uh, ever since uh, Jesus Christ and tried to uh, emphasize that. For a marriage in the Catholic Church to be understood as a sacrament, there must be a public commitment before God and the gathered church with the priest or the deacon as the official witness. And So that's the first part. And secondly, a life lived together. There must be a consummation of that marriage, what we would call a, a, a sexual a union or a sexual com, a consummation after the wedding ceremony and their life lived together. So those two things need to take place. Uh, the public declaration of marriage that's witnessed by the church and then the life of the couple uh, together uh, signified by the consummation uh, on, uh, in their wedding bed. So, so th those two things are extremely important. So for a marriage to be a sacrament and therefore a lifelong or permanent union in this life, several things must be in place at the time of the marriage. In fact, when couples get married in the Catholic Church, there are three questions that we ask them during the ceremony. And the first question is, have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourselves in marriage? Now the presumption is, by that point, that they have come here freely and without reservation. Okay. That's what I'm presuming when I ask that question and that they say, yes, we've come here freely and without reservation. But I don't know all things and somebody could keep secrets from me and maybe <clears throat> the husband-to-be has kept a secret from his wife-to-be or the wife-to-be has kept a secret from uh, her husband-to-be. Maybe the wife-to-be has been thinking, God, what a mistake I have made, but my parents have spent all this money on this wedding and the reception. I just can't get out. I just don't like this man. And, but we're going to put on a good show here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so if that were the case, let's say, and we could prove that later on, let's say if the marriage ended in a divorce, then we would say that from the very beginning, there was not proper consent given because, in fact, they had not come there freely and without reservation to give themselves in marriage. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Then the second question we ask is, oh, thank you. 
will you love and honor each other as husband and wife for the rest of your lives? Now there's two uh, difficult parts to this question. Will you love each other as husband and wife? Okay, number one. And then number two, for the rest of your lives. Okay, so think about that. Okay. Now, as attractive as a bride and groom are on their wedding day, I'm sure that the groom is wondering what he, she's going to look like uh, 40 years down the line, and then he turns back and sees the mother of the bride and realizes, oh my God! Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, so perhaps uh, he has no intention of either loving or, uh, his, his wife, uh, or uh, for the rest of his life, okay? Uh, there's a secret there. Maybe he's told his best man that, you know, this, I've got so many problems here. Or, 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 so it doesn't have to be both together. One or the other could be having the reservations that would invalidate the marriage as a sacrament. It's still a marriage, legal bond, but as a sacrament it could be uh, invalid. Then the third question is, will you bring your children up According to, will you accept children lovingly and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? Which tells us that that's a, a very important understanding of what Christian marriage is, that it's for the begetting, begetting of children uh, and forming a Christian family where the love of husband and wife uh, nourishes and sustains that family and, and creates a loving environment where the faith can be handed on. Now this doesn't happen so much today, but when I was first ordained 32 years ago, I was in Albany, Georgia, and I had a lot of teenagers that wanted to get married in the church. And I think it was just the culture of Albany at that time, and people were getting married at a younger age at that period of time as well. My sister got married at 19. Uh, so I would have 17 and 18 year olds come, and you know how ideal they are, and um, so I'd be preparing them for marriage, and, and I'd say, well, do you intend to have children down the, the road? And they would look at each other and say, well, no, I don't think so. You know, having a nice house and a lot of possessions and a car, I think we're going to focus more on that. Well, I'd have to delve into that a little bit more with them to find out if they were serious, but if they were, in fact, serious, uh, I could not perform their marriage in the church because they would have to be able to answer this question in the affirmative, that they would have children, first of all, be open to having children, and that... Uh, they would bring their children up according to the law of Christ in his church, meaning they would have them baptized, make sure that they go through the other sacraments and rear them in the practice of the faith and create a Christian home. Now, I have, I'm going to talk about annulments toward the end of this, but I uh, was successful with a number of people who have come to me for Catholic annulments uh, based upon the fact that either the husband or the wife did not want to have children and made it very clear to one of the spouses that they did not want to have children. So that would be a, a grounds for an annulment in the Catholic Church. The, the vows further um, make clear the permanence of marriage with the actual stating of the vows. I take you to be my wife or husband. I will love you and honor you in sickness and health uh, in good times and in bad, until death do us part. So that just kind of re-emphasizes what was just uh, created in uh, the three questions that were answered. So for a, mar a Catholic marriage to be a valid sacramental marriage, there can be no deception, there has to be a capability of sexual intercourse for the beginning of children, they have to be psychologically competent of age, uh, and there cannot be a prior uh, sacramental marriage uh, that has not been uh, looked at by the church. Um, so no deception. Let's say that after I've had this splendid wedding upstairs at uh, St. Joseph's and the couple has been living together as husband and wife and I presume blissfully and then the bride comes in to me crying and saying, Father, I've got to leave my husband. I said, well, what in the world is going wrong? Well, he just told me that he spent 10 years in prison as a convicted felon, and he didn't tell me that before the marriage. There was deception. So that would invalidate this wonderful wedding, or marriage. The wedding is not the marriage. The marriage together is the sacrament. But uh, 
it would invalidate it as a sacrament. Now, when I say it invalidates it as a sacrament, I want to make a clear distinction. All marriages in the eyes of the Catholic Church that take place in the Catholic Church, first of all, between two baptized people, and all marriages of Christians whether who, who are not Catholic, if it's their first marriage, no matter how that marriage takes place, whether it's in a Protestant church, in a, a sunny field, or considered a marriage through common law, that the state recognizes it after a certain period of time of living together, the Catholic Church recognizes all of those marriages as sacramental marriages. Okay? Because it's your life together that really is the sacrament and the recognition either of the church's authority or the state's authority uh, in that regard, if it's the first marriage. So those of you who are not Catholic but are married and, and married to someone who it was the first marriage to you, it's both the first marriage and it took place in the Methodist Church or the Baptist Church or by a Protestant minister or whatever. You don't have to have your marriage blessed in the church in order to make it a Catholic sacrament. It already is a Catholic sacrament in the eyes of the Catholic Church. Okay? Because marriage transcends Catholic Church law. It is divinely established. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Now, yes? First marriage. It has to be a first marriage for both. Uh, so if there's a previous bond for either, then that calls the whole thing into question. Okay? Um, because it's the first marriage, that's the sacrament. Now, these unusual situations where, for whatever reason, there could be something in place that makes the wedding invalid, not the wedding, I should say the marriage invalid, the ma wedding's just a ceremony, um, the church still presumes until it grants an annulment that it is a sacrament. And even once you divorce and then get a church annulment, your time together as husband and wife, from the very beginning until it ended, is considered a legal union. So everything in the marriage is legal and moral, okay? Including your relationship and any children that you have. Uh, that's where a lot of people misunderstand Catholic annulments. We're not making a declaration about the legality of the marriage. We're making a declaration about the sacramentality of the marriage. And there's a difference, okay? A big difference. Is that me? No, that's somebody else. Okay. We all are wondering, or is that my cell phone? Okay. Okay. So what is the purpose of marriage? There are two primary purposes. First, to share with God the creative power of bringing new life into the world and forming a Christian family. Marriage has as its primary purpose the bearing and rearing of children and forming Christian families. So that's why we say, you know, the desire to have children is so important. Then uh, the other primary purpose of marriage is the development of mutual and supportive love between the husband and wife. For both primary purposes of marriage, human sexuality plays a most important role. In fact, within marriage, the sacrament of marriage, sexuality is raised to the level of a sacrament. Because through sexual sharing of a husband and wife, the presence of God is revealed through uh, the miracle of conception, uh, which is the primary purpose of, uh, of the marital act. That's why we call it the marital act, uh, because it finds its fulfillment within marriage. Sexual intercourse does. And in the Catholic Church, sexual intercourse within marriage has two purposes. First, to unite the couple, obviously, and to sustain their love, so the romantic, the pleasurable, uh, the intimacy that one experiences within uh, the, the sexual relationship is extremely important in the eyes of the Church for keeping the couple strong in love, uniting them, bonding to them to each other so that they will then show to their children that they love each other and that will enable them to love their, their children and, and create a, a loving environment for their children. But we also recognize through natural law that the whole reason that you want to do it apart from uh, the uh, pleasurable part 
Well, I should say the whole reason, the pleasurable part there is so that you will want to do it, is for what? To have children. So if nobody had any sexual desire at all, what would happen to our world population? <laughs> it would tank. Okay. So, so that tells you that written into natural law, which doesn't take a theologian to figure out, or you don't have to be a Catholic to believe, written into the very design of, of human sexuality is not only the desire for it because of the, you know, the, the bond that it creates and the feelings that are, are brought about, but also so that you will have sexual intercourse in order to procreate and bring about new life. The two go hand in hand. You cannot morally eliminate one or the other intentionally, according to Catholic teaching, uh, within uh, obviously the sacrament of marriage, where the marital act finds its fulfillment. Does, that, does everybody understand that? So that's one of the reasons that we would say that the marital act is immoral when you're not married, okay? So, and we call that not the marital act. What do we call it when you're not married and you have the marital act? Adultery. Fornication. Fornication if you're not married, okay? And adultery if you're, have, if you're married and, and choosing somebody else that's not your spouse. Because we are offending God by making the marital act into something that it is not supposed to be, was not intended to be, primarily, okay? That is another reason why, or one of the reasons why, Pope Paul VI in 1968 reiterated the church's teaching on natural law as it pertains to marriage and the marital act, and that one cannot change the nature of human sexuality through mechanical means or um, uh, medicinal means, because that, by that time the, the pill had been developed in the late 50s, early 1960s, so you had a medication uh, to change the disease of the marital act so that one does not uh, um, develop a cancer, which is a child. See the language that I'm talking, using here? Okay, because if you think that uh, children are a disease, you'll want to take medicine to prevent it, correct? Okay, uh, and if you think that sex should only be for pleasure, you don't want to have children mess it up, right? Um, so that's the whole, one of the reasons behind artificial birth control is to change the meaning of the marital act and make it exclusively pleasurable, okay? Uh, unless you decide on your own that you will be God and then you'll take yourself off the birth control and then create a child. Um, so, so what I'm saying is it goes against natural law and the Catholic Church cannot condone anything that goes against natural law because natural law is God's law, it's divine law. We cannot change divine law. So we live now in a contraceptive mentality, correct, since 1968 where most people are using contraception and they're not bothering to get married nor, nor do they see the marital act as the marital act. They see it as something else altogether different. And, uh, and now they have a whole new variety of ways that the marital act can be expressed uh, even though it's not marriage. Um, and when you have a contraceptive mentality and your whole goal is to prevent the disease of a child then when the disease comes upon you, you have to go to a doctor for what? Abortion. An abortion. To uh, remove the tumor because your medication failed you. Um, and see what I'm, where I'm going with all of this and, and how this, this mentality of contraception has led to widespread spread abortion. Uh, because it's, that's just part of the mentality of, of changing the meaning of the purpose of sex. Yes? Um, I wanted to comment also that that mentality, when I got pregnant with my third baby, I was devastated. And I think people get pregnant in a way that's wholesome and good, but because of our society, pregnancy could be such awful news. Yes, it's not good news. I mean, I'm sorry, weeks. you're pregnant. Oh my yeah, goodness. Yeah. yeah, it took me several <laughs> weeks before I could right. enjoy it. I have a doctor I can send you to to take care of that yeah. problem, that disease. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it was, it was, I mean, it just was inconvenient for me, but our society says that inconvenient is a way to perceive it. Right. And I don't right. know. It just, right. I was in an ideal situation and I felt upset about getting pregnant. 
right? And and I know you know families that are still having like five, six, seven. I have we have two parishioners in the parish. One just had her ninth baby, and another her eleventh. Okay. <laughs> But you can imagine how people look at them and ridicule them. And they're the happiest families I know. I mean, you know, it, uh, and, you know, it, and it works. And, you know, I asked the, the mother of the one that just had her 11th, I said, now, because our other children are, are grown, so they can help. You know, that's the benefit of having a large family. Your other children pick up the slack and help you. So, it's, you know, it works uh, if you're not embarrassed about it. So, we've already talked about what the sexual sins are, fornication, adultery, uh, anything that would in any way change the meaning of human sexuality as God intended. Now, we're not perfect. We're all born with original sin, and we have a tendency to concupiscence. And so these are not unforgivable sins uh, if we fail in human sexuality. Uh, we can see God's forgiveness. So that's the most important thing. So I've already talked about, and then the other thing, I already talked about the reason why the Catholic Church is opposed to artificial contraception, whether it is uh, the pill or any mechanical thing that you might use. Yes? What about artificial insemination? Okay, now that's a little bit different. Uh, again, we would have to be respectful of natural processes here and how uh, the sperm is collected, okay? The church would be opposed to uh, random selection, just going to a store and buying what you need, okay? <laughs> okay. That would be considered immoral and unnatural. What, what about, say, it's like my brother's an OBGYN. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a tough job because of the moral like teaching. Yeah. I don't think I would like to have it. Like, with, like mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way I would go with it. I would go like say I'll take uh, I'll take the blonde and the blue eyes and the male you know mm -hmm. and put it in the shopping cart and go it wouldn't right. be like that. Be, you know, like. The, the point would be that I've already had a table I guess because I've had three kids mm -hmm. three at the age of twenty thirty one and thirty eight mm -hmm. figured I was three mm -hmm. but we've talked about it and you know the chances if you have a table I guess reversed. So to to bypass the tubes. Well, yeah. Whether you can conceive or not at my age of forty five would be iffy. Right. But from what I've researched and looked at, the artificial insemination between us would be a, would be a better chance. To uh, fertilize the egg outside and then implant the the fertilized uh, ovum. Okay. The only way that the church would permit that from a moral point of view is that it's your sperm and your egg and only one egg or two eggs are fertilized. Okay? No more because they're all human beings once they're fertilized. Okay? So you're not just going to discard those um, or put them in the deep freeze. Um, it, it is then a question of the collection of the sperm and how that is done okay? and how this process takes place. So it's more complicated uh, from the Catholic perspective. Uh, and then it would be implanted in your, your, your womb or uterus, whatever. Um, but as long as that takes place. But if you did multiple uh, fertilizations of the eggs and then discarded what you didn't want, then that would be a moral dilemma. Very grave moral evil, actually. So that would, that's important to, to keep in mind. Now, the other thing that Pope Paul VI was concerned about in 1968, which was the beginning of the sexual revolution, but it was going on in the late 50s, and in the 1950s, and into the 60s kind of it went to its apex, was that he feared that if he were to approve artificial contraception, that men would only, men would, be, when the power of procreation was taken away, the, the, the awesomeness of creating new life through sexual intercourse was taken away, that men would then begin to view their wives and women in general as sex objects for their own personal pleasure, independent of uh, the responsibilities that come with creating a new life and forming a Christian family. And he felt that the, moral, the sexual morality of society would disintegrate. Now he said this in 1968. 
is 2011. Okay. <laughs> Just exactly this, uh, what he feared or prophesied has taken place. I don't know that he realized that women would start viewing men <laughs> as sexual objects too, okay. I don't know that he saw that component of it, but that's happened as well, correct? Uh, and when you start making objects of each other, is that healthy? It denigrates who you are as a human being, yes? I think the, the biggest problem is that because we see the example of marriage in the crucifixion of Christ on the cross and giving of self mm -hmm. totally to one another, mm -hmm. and then when you take away, and the other opposite is being selfish, Right. So society now looks at it as two as, as a as a just a I guess just a, uh, a get together, you know, for the for the fun of it. And each person is not there committed in any way, you know. So it's both a selfish act on on each other's part, which is just the opposite of what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an act of self giving totally one right. to each other. Right. Now the other thing is, if you eliminate uh, procreation, the procreative aspect of sexuality as God-given, natural law, divine law, what does that then open marriage to? Anything and everything. Anything and everything, and that's where we are today. Okay, the Pope was prophetic. He was also worried about sexually transmitted diseases. I don't think he had any idea that. AIDS would become a phenomenon uh, out of a licentious uh, expression of sex. Um, but certainly he was concerned about that uh, and, and we have seen you know, that uh, escalate to a phenomenal uh, number of cases that was not present in the 1940s and 50s. There was some of that, but not to the extent that there is today. Now, the Catholic Church does approve of natural birth control. And it's not just the rhythm method, which some people called uh, Roman roulette. Um, <laughs> but there is a sophisticated way for you, and a scientific way for you to, to, to determine, for a woman to determine when her fertile period will be. If Now these are all things being equal, that her fertility cycle is, is normal and all the rest of that. And then once you decide when the fertile period is, or determine that through a, 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 you know, a, a scientific means of doing it, then in order to conceive, you would obviously have sexual intercourse during that fertile period. Or if you want to plan your family and not uh, have any children within that, or conceive any children within that fertile period, you would abstain from sex during that fertile period. Now, I'll have to have others tell me, but I've been told that the fertile period, in, for most women, normal fertile period, once you know what it is, lasts, what, 10 days, is it? Is it 10 days? Up to 10 days. It could be longer or shorter. Uh, 10 to 14 days. Which means that you would abstain from sexual intercourse during that time. Now, I know for a fact that married couples who practice this form of natural family planning appreciate their sexuality even more when they make a decision for a two-week period not to engage in sexual intercourse. <coughs> that it's, it's something that they appreciate more and don't take for granted and know that there will be times when they will abstain uh, and they will not have sex on demand. Uh, uh, so, so, and it gives them a better, a more a wholesome understanding of human sexuality but also of its power. But even during the infertile period, if you practice natural family planning, you should be open to life because you know not what miracles God can produce in an infertile woman. Okay, so, so, you, so there should be some openness to life there. And even those that practice artificial birth control know that it's only 98% effective, correct? So uh, there's always the possibility that God will have his way no matter how much you try to thwart him. So uh, that's, you know, an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Many years ago when I was uh, stationed in Savannah, this would have been in the early 80s, um, we used to have uh, at the cathedral uh, a class which would last maybe four or five sessions over the course of four or five weeks on how to do natural family planning. We'd have doctors and others who were aware of it to come in and to teach couples how to do it specifically. And um, we'd always have some Protestants coming. And, and I thought, well, why? You know, they don't have any prohibition in their churches against uh, artificial birth control. Why are they coming to our natural family planning classes? 
And back then, I don't know if it's as true today as it was back then, but you know, back then there was the uh, going natural movement, uh, and they didn't want to use medication. They wanted to do it naturally. Uh, and um, you know that tells you something. You know, it's wholesome. <laughs> it's healthy uh, to to practice that form of of artificial, uh, not artificial, that form of natural family planning. Now, what are the obligation? What obligations do Catholics, Roman Catholics, have toward marriage? Now, these requ these requirements that I'm about to go over are just for those of us who are Catholic, or for those intending to become Catholic, in terms of marriage. First. You must be married in the Catholic Church before a priest or a deacon of the Catholic Church or a bishop. Okay? So you do not have a right as a Catholic uh, to marry outside of the Catholic Church or by another denomination or by a just, judge or whatever. Because it is a sacrament of the Church, it must take place within the context of the Catholic Church and the ministers of the Catholic Church, whether it's a bishop, priest, or deacon. Now, in rare or special circumstances, the church can give permission to a Catholic who is marrying, let's say, a Baptist, and the Baptist has a very close link with her church and the minister there, and they could have the ceremony there, but that's by way of permission from the bishop. It's a dispensation. It's out of the, the, the usual or out of the normal. Because it's not the marriage, the wedding ceremony itself that is the sacrament, it's your life together. Uh, the wedding ceremony is just the public declaration of that intention to live as husband and wife. So if you marry, if a Catholic marries outside of the Catholic Church, that marriage is considered invalid from the very beginning, unless they got permission to have it done. Then a Catholic, Catholics must promise to rear their, have their children baptized and reared as Catholics. So if a uh, a couple comes to me who wants to get married as a Catholic groom and a Baptist wife or, or a bride. I have to reiterate to them for me to do the wedding in the Catholic Church and for it to be sacramental. The groom who is the uh, Catholic in that uh, example must promise in writing that he will have their children baptized Catholic and brought up in the Catholic Church. And that's a very serious responsibility for Catholics, okay? Um, but obviously, in a mixed marriage situation like that, um, the one who's not Catholic has to have some agreement to that, or there's going to be problems in the marriage. So I always tell young people, teenagers, older people that are planning on getting married, that they have to know that and, and discuss that with their fiancé if their fiancé is not Catholic. But also, there must be respect for each other's conscience especially their religious conscience. We also require Catholics to attend premarital classes, premarriage classes, and um, we pray that they will marry a Christian or have a dispensation to marry someone who is not a Christian. Okay? Is there any question on any of that? Okay. Now for non-Catholics, Baptist, Methodist, or whatever, church law in that regard does not apply. And, as I mentioned, if it's your first marriage and you got married by a Baptist minister or justice of the peace or whatever, the Catholic Church views that marriage as a Catholic marriage, uh, a sacramental marriage, okay? Is, is there any question on that? Because you're not under church law. Yes? All right, if you have, let's say you have a Baptist and Catholic get married, and the Catholic is like, well, yes, we'll ra I'll raise the children Catholic, can the Baptist also be like, and will raise the child Baptist? What we would say to them is, we're, all we're looking for is the promise to, to have them raised Catholic. Now, how they're going to work it out is kind of left to them, but so I would... it's not bad for us to bring our children to Mass on Saturday and then to, Catholic, to Baptist Church on Sunday? Right, but we would say that they should identify with the Catholic Church and know that they're just visiting the Baptist Church and learning about the religion of their other parent. But their primary identity has to be uh, as Catholics. Now, when I was in my previous parish in Augusta, uh, one of our one of my Catholic parishioners was married to, and he was the groom or the husband. He was married to a Presbyterian minister, and I baptized their children in the Catholic Church. But I know that that somehow there was some sort of 
communication to these children what Presbyterians, because she's a Presbyterian minister, believes. Uh, if you go into that ideal, but then you have children, you live You have to work things out, them, right, right. And you respect right. each other's spiritual consciousness. Right. What if later down the road that Baptist is like, uh, that's not, that doesn't vibe with my consciousness after all? Well, yeah, that's why it's difficult. Is that part of the vows? Really? Just well, uh, well, you say that what we ask you, do, do you, will you accept children lovingly and bring them up according to the law of Christ and the Catholic Church? So that is part of your wedding vow? Yes. <laughs> no. okay. Yeah, okay. it's there. But the Catholic is the one responsible for the rearing of the child. Now, years ago, up until about 1964, 65 maybe, we used to require the Protestant to make the promise that they would raise their children Catholic. And I would say, maybe not in this room, but I have known of many superb Roman Catholics whose Catholic parent was negligent in rearing them as Catholics, but their Protestant mother brought them up in the Catholic faith. And they are wonderful Catholics. And their mother never became a Catholic. That happened to my nephew, you know, who is now 30-something uh, years old. His father, my brother, was absent in bringing him up in the Catholic faith. His mother, my brother's ex-wife, a Baptist, made sure he was an altar boy, made his first communion, went to confirmation, and got a Christian or a cat, went to Sunday school. She did that. So, you know, it happens. It's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting uh, when you stop and think about it. Yes. They've got children, and quite a few, and they're all Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, at, back then, was that the way it was? But back then it was like that, right. Okay. Right. Very good. Yes? If a, if a Catholic was married to a non-Catholic in second marriage, and the first marriage was a non by the church, mm -hmm. that second marriage is considered a sacrament. Yes. Now we always presume every marriage that takes place in the church is a sacrament. So you have to go through an annulment procedure, which I'm going to talk about now, uh, which is a court, a legal procedure within the Catholic Church, not a civil law procedure, to determine whether or not the marriage in fact is a sacrament. It puts the marriage on trial. Okay, so let's talk about annulments. Let's say that two Catholics get married in the church, and you know, let's say that they have children and they're married for about 15 years, but it was a rocky marriage, and after 15 years, they decide to call it quits because of irreconcilable differences or whatever. Then, after they receive, they can only apply for a church annulment once the legal divorce is granted, the civil divorce is granted. So they get the civil divorce and then they begin the procedure to see whether or not their marriage was a sacrament. So they put, basically are asking the Catholic Church to put their marriage on trial uh, in terms of whether or not it is a sacrament to see whether or not the presumption that it is a sacrament is true. Now this court procedure is a trial but it's all done through written testimony. So you don't go to a judge and sit down in front of him and, and, and are deposed. You do go to a judge, but it's through the mail, okay? You answer questionnaires and swear that you're going to tell the truth and sign the questionnaire. And various questions are asked of you about your marriage, especially your courtship and the events that led up to the marriage. And then, of course, of whatever problems may have occurred during the marriage. And what the church is looking for is, was there anything wrong about the consent, your vows, that you gave at the time of your wedding. In fact, during the courtship, were there any signs that this marriage was inadvisable? And did anybody who know, knew you try to talk you out of this? Okay, Because they had some concerns, whether it's your parents or good friends or whatever. And let's say that you know, for um, let's say that I'm the husband, and I'm the one that's actually seeking the annulment. So I'm doing the paperwork for the church. And uh, I know for a fact that during our courtship, my fiance uh, had other relations. I caught her once. But then I learned after I was married that she had had many that I did not know about. And that she had no intention of being faithful to me once she was married. That in and of itself would be uh, invalid. 
it caused the marriage to be considered invalid as a sacrament. But the annulment procedure has to have evidence of that. So if what I say is true, I have to have witnesses who could substantiate my testimony, again, in a written form. So I would supply the names of two or three witnesses who might have known that, okay? And they would testify on my behalf that, in fact, yes, she had multiple relationships apart from me during our courtship, and they knew for a fact that she had no intention of being faithful in marriage. The church could grant an annulment based on that. Or let's say that there's some mental illness that did not make itself known until after the marriage, but you discover that you know, there was a serious mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia or whatever, but you were un unaware of it. Okay? That could invalidate the marriage. Okay? Now let's say that you marry somebody that has a mental illness and it's up front and you've been to the doctors with each other and you know about it, that would be different. But if there's deception or an undiagnosed thing, and then that creates problems in the marriage later on that you did not anticipate, then that creates a different scenario. Um, what other things could be annulment, grounds for annulment? Uh, but you'd have to have witnesses to testify to this. You can't just say, well, she cheated on me. We'd have to prove that, so to speak. Well, abuse. Would be one. abuse. Uh, let's say that the person was abusive and, uh, and there was evidence. Let's say that there was signs in the courtship that he was a little bit violent, maybe he got into arguments and fought with people, and maybe he, he got mad at you occasionally, but you never thought anything about it. But then once you got married, it went from verbal abuse to physical abuse. Well, if we could link that to uh, a violent behavior, whatever type, in the courtship, that could be grounds for, for an annulment as well. Okay. Yes? What if you couldn't link it? Say it just happened after the marriage. Well, then we, we have to prove it, that's, that's because it's a court procedure. So that's, the part, that's one of the reasons Catholics cannot get annulments, especially later on in life, because their witnesses are either don't remember or they're dead. So if there are no witnesses to substantiate, substantiate or corroborate the testimony, then the church can't go forward with a legal procedure, just as you can't do it in, in civil law either. Okay? Yes? That's my problem. I cannot get my first marriage and all because all the witnesses are, are gone. So, in, and you're not planning marriage in the future, yeah. are you? So forget about it. <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> you don't need it at all. <laughs> Just, <laughs> okay. Yes, Kelly. All right. What if the marriage, I mean, we're all talking about these things with courtship and at, at the time of marriage. Mm -hmm. Let's say the marriage seemed just great <laughs> until 15 years and then... And then one of the partners decided no longer to be faithful and no longer to be active in the marriage. That would not be grounds for an annulment. You know, and that's, so that yeah. means that even though, so that means the one who was faithful has, ne can never have a valid marriage. Okay. Correct, unless you kill the person. <laughs> <laughs> or pray, pray for a train wreck or something. You know, so. <laughs> but there could be other, right, you wouldn't need an annulment then. Uh, but, but, well, you see, you could still apply for an annulment because there could be something that you could uncover in that that would s indicate that, you know, there really was something screwy to begin with. I never put my finger on it, but now with 2020 hindsight, I can see certain things. Does that make sense? So you yeah. have to bring it back to the beginning. Correct. You do have to bring it back to the beginning. Right. Even with right. physical abuse. Well, uh, not necessarily the hitting, but the, the personality traits that is manifested in a person who is abusive. So he may not have been physically abusive, but there could have been signs. He was always flying off the handle in our courtship. He went into road rage. Uh, he, he was immature, okay? And that could be grounds, okay? Immaturity would be grounds, definitely. So okay. you're saying even if a woman's like physically abused, mm -hmm. maybe she had no, you know, because I mean, from what I've known people that this has happened after the mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, they can't, that it can't be annulled, you still have to go all the way back? Correct. Not the, the, you, you, you start with the abuse or whatever the problem is, and then you work back to see, was there any indication of this back then? And more than likely there was, you know, more than likely. You could see something. But I mean, you would yeah. not say, okay, right. you've got to stay in this marriage. You no, 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 okay, that's a, good, that's a very important question. Okay, that's a very good point. Even if your marriage is a lifelong sacrament, the church does not require you to remain in an abusive situation. 
that you have a right to protect yourself and to separate. Uh, and for legal purposes, you could seek a legal divorce to make sure there's financial justice and the, the children are taken care of and all of that. But in the eyes of the Catholic Church, even though you're not living together and even though he might get married again, you're still married to each other, sacramentally, okay? But you don't have to stay with that person if it's abusive. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Yes. Well, basically, you can show the comparison of marriage and the Eucharist, how they mirror each other in a way. Say that again. How marriage and the Eucharist are, are very closely linked. I think it's always interesting. The church architecture, the Baldacchino, and... Very good. Well, let, me, let me expand that. Uh, obviously, St. Paul says that the love that a husband and wife have for each other is the type of love that Christ, the bridegroom, has for his bride, which is the church. So marriage is meant to be a sign of that. The greatest sign of our marriage as a church to Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, is where? The, the Mass, the, the, the Holy Eucharist. Now... This might be foreign to many of you, but um, in many Catholic churches, in the primary one that you would all recognize is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, there is a canopy over the altar, correct? Does that bring any image to you in terms of Jewish weddings? They have a big canopy over them. It's interesting that in, in Catholic uh, architecture for churches, which is not mandated, that the canopy, which is called a Baltikino, uh, or Baltican in English, I guess, um, is a wedding um, structure where the altar is and the consummation of the bridal or spousal relationship of Christ to his bride, the church, takes place at the altar. Okay, so there's a relation there, there's a link there. Now, what's interesting though, this, since the Second Vatican Council, which means since about 1964-65, the church has uh, loosened up its requirements for church architecture and, and to our detriment, unfortunately. But, even, but prior to that, even the simplest church that was built had to have some kind of a built-in canopy over the main altar. Sometimes it housed lighting or whatever, but there was a distinctive structure, whether it was artistic or not, that was over the altar. Even on our old altar upstairs, the, the, high, the, the, the backdrop, the, the tall, where the crucifix is, on the, the marble crucifix, if you look, there, the original altar is, is the table, that, not where I celebrate Mass now, but up against where the tabernacle is. If you look, there's a little canopy over that, which is uh, symbolic of that. So most uh, Catholic churches up until about 1965-66 would have had some sort of structure or hanging thing over the altar or a, a Baltikino that has four posts. Uh, so that, that links that. Does that answer? The, yeah, I, think it's, I just want to share that. I think it's, quite, it's a beautiful understanding of the relationship. So does anybody have, okay, in terms of Catholic annulments, there's also two other types. One's called a Pauline privilege. This privilege given to converts to the Catholic faith to dissolve a marriage with an unbaptized spouse if either obstructs the religious practice of the other. Okay, so let's say that you're not Catholic and the spouse that you have opposes you becoming uh, a Catholic the church can grant you what is called a, a, a Pauline privilege, which is not an annulment, where that marriage is actually dissolved, not annulled. And then there is Petrine, or the St. Peter privilege. The implement, implementation of this procedure is reserved only to the Pope himself. It involves the circumstances where one of the parties in the marriage is unbaptized and the other is baptized. Either party wants to become Catholic or wants to marry a Catholic, thus the Pope may act in favor of the Catholic faith and dissolve the marriage to the other person if it's not considered a sacrament. So those are just kind of rare things that are permissible in the church. Now the whole annulment procedure in the Catholic Church is meant to be a pastoral outreach to people who have had problems in their marriage and to help them, especially if they wish to enter into a second marriage. So it's, it, even though it's a legal procedure, it's meant to be an outreach to help people who, for whatever reason, 
have not had the ideal or, or what the church would have hoped for uh, or what they would have hoped for in their marriage. So are there any questions on any of that? Yes. I have a question for something from before. You know, you talked about the, um, uh, the natural method of... Um, family planning. Family planning. <clears throat> but also the importance of children in the marriage. So is, is the natural family planning only okay after you've had at least one child? Is that the... Uh, okay, if, if both spouses have the right to sex in the marriage, can the can one of them say, "Well, I don't want to have children yet, so this this time period, I'm not willing to do that." It should be a mutual dis uh, agreement. Uh -huh. okay. okay. There should be some negotiation there. Okay, and then one other thing that's been in my cross since last week. Um, okay, Jesus and the church, the husband and wife. Is that a symbol or a metaphor or what? Because it's a the, metaphor. Church, the church is men and women. Correct, but collectively uh, it's considered in the feminine. But, I mean, The why? institution. Who says that? I mean, who the, that? Uh, the scriptures and tradition. The church says... Okay, well, the scriptures say Jesus and the church. What if crazy times happened, Jesus was a woman? Could they have said, this is Jesus and the church, the groom and the bride? The church being feminine, to me, is very arbitrary. But it's not. I mean, it's, it's designed that way, and, it, and even... Um, I realize what I just said made you cringe. Right, but, but, <laughs> but, but if you can go back to the Old Testament times, the feminine aspect uh, of the people of God was present there, too. So, in a symbolic sense, uh, and it finds its fulfillment in the church. But, because then ultimately, what happens is women don't have the right... You didn't put it that way. Women don't have the privilege of serving God in the same way that men do in the Catholic Church. Correct. And because, but I also, I the, feel like that's antiquated. Well, wait, 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 let me let me explain. But women do not have a right to um, uh, be husbands either in society. Yeah, because it's natural. It's based on natural law. What does law. that mean? I mean, if if a, if a couple is married and there's a woman and a man, how can the woman play husband? Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? like, so it's not okay. So it's not it's not Catholic for a woman to be the money maker and the man to stay home. No, it's not that. We're we're talking about the femininity of the woman and the masculinity of the man. The man cannot have a child. He cannot. Right. Okay. There's nothing arbitrary about it. It's designed that way. And so, is it because okay. the body of the church is what creates the children of the church? Correct. The, the church is considered feminine and holy mother. And from her, new members come forth through Christ, who is the, the bride, uh, the groom. Okay, so, so, so I guess ultimately what the I masculinity mean, of Christ was no accident. It was the well, plan. You if know, Jesus had been a woman, nobody would have listened to her. But it was. No, that's not true. That's. But I that mean, is I not know, true. I that is not true. Said, In the Old Testament, nobody's listened to women except for the last hundred years. In the Old Testament times. In the pagan religions surrounding Israel, there were priestesses and female gods. In the Old Testament times, it was very much a part of the culture, and women held very high authority. And even in the early church, women held high political authority in the culture. So to use that argument is false. That's a, a red herring. Okay, so. Jezebel and, and the Queen of Sheba and all, you know, all of that. So, uh, but what we would say is also what Christ only chose 12 men. He w could have chosen a woman. He could have ordained his mother, but he didn't. So those, it's, you have to look at the history too, the tradition, which is important in the Catholic Church. Right. Okay. All right. One, yes. I'm both parties female and the male, regardless of the, the whole thing, we're both responsible for the marriage, children, and, you know, bringing up the children and the, the couple relationship we've got. I mean, it's just, we're well, simple. We're both ideally, it's well, well, it's complimentary. It's com uh, ideally, it's true. Yes. Um, But not for contraception. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, you can take. Side 
as a... Yeah, uh, I think you can take it uh, to regulate your cycle and all, and that's the purpose, you know. So you can take it as medication. And there's a lot of medication that can hinder uh, a conception of a child. So, but if you're taking it for that reason, certainly, yes. Yeah. But the church would also be concerned, though, of course this may not be the case in a, for, for somebody, but some uh, artificial contraception is abortifacient, means that it expels uh, uh, a fertilized egg. So, so, so th that would have to be taken into it, yeah. Also, and I think maybe Buck can help me with this, I had a situation of somebody in my class who is a dermatologist and there's a medication they give to uh, men or women to clear up uh, severe cases of Accutane that if you conceive a child while you're taking that, that child is going to be terribly deformed. deformed. Yes, and so they recommend if you're married or, you know, uh, whatever, that you take uh, birth control to prevent pregnancy. So my resident theologian here, how would you feel about that? A good one, actually. I would still say that if you leave aside for a moment the question of the abortifacient nature, then it's clearly a thing called double effect, which means if you're doing it for one reason, and the reason you're doing it uh, is completely licit, like a matter of health. If I don't take the pill, I'm going to bleed to death one of these months. Then that's fine, even if a, another effect would be to act as a contraceptive. If you're not, do, if you're not using, if that's just a side effect, as it were, then it's acceptable. Uh, now it gets com more complicated if you know that <coughs> one of the side effects is an abortion, since abortion is an intrinsic. Uh, I would say, and this is me and not the church talking, that that possibility would then outweigh the double effect permission. Now, now what about this Accutane thing, that you're prescribed Accutane to treat something, and you're a woman, and if you conceive while taking this medication, you're going to have a severely deformed child? Well, you know, I'd say that the easy answer to that is if you're only taking it for, for a short term, then abstain. Uh, but people don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say, a lot of people come up to me and say, well, well Buck, you know, what if I can't have children anymore? What if the doctor has told me that it's dangerous for me to have children? I say, that's not what you're asking. The easy answer for that is to be self abstain. What you're asking me is, how can I do that and still get to have sex? That's a different question. Mm -hmm. All um, right, the birth control for the Accutane is not is to keep the person from having the baby with all the severe birth right. defects I, I and to cover that. the doctor because if that happened they would take right. on that. Right. But you they can be sued, use yeah. abstinence is yeah. one of them if you are just totally against it. Because there's a system set up and we have to go online, we have to answer these questions right. and every month these females go online and they answer these questions. You can put abstinence on there and male latex condoms but you have to have two birth controls listed in order for them to be on the medicine. And you have to have acne that's severe. Yeah, it has to be a, a very serious thing. So it's not just a cosmetic sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, that would be, I, I would confirm that, and I'm not a most normal theologian, so, because you would be taking the pill in that case. Uh, I mean, you would be taking it for the purpose of contraception. So double effect would not cover you in that circumstance. Well, let's say that you needed the medication and, and to prevent a greater evil of a, knowing that this drug would cause a malformed child. I'm not sure if in, in moral theology you can, you can deliberately choose an evil and justify it by saying it's okay because it's less of an evil than, yeah. than another one. Well, I'd have to look into that, that whole thing. Your motive and all that, right. We did have a mother come in with a mm -hmm. teenage daughter that... Um, they will give birth control for hormonal issues right, to right. try to clear the, the face, right. not on Accutane. Right. Right. Because it's yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. That's different. Um, yeah. And she looked at the provider I was working with, and she's like, no, she cannot do that. She's Catholic. We go in the hall, and he's like, what's that supposed to mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, no, she could have if, if the wasn't for uh, 
Now, maybe the parents were fearful that once she got on that, then there would be reckless abandon. But uh, so that could be the other thing. So, what if, say, a mother forces her children, her female children, to take birth control pills for the sole purpose of keeping them from conceiving? Well, that would be her, the mother's sin. That would be yeah. the mother. Would that make her like go to hell or something? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God is going to judge that, but but certainly, yeah, yeah. I think you can make some some criteria on that. So, all right. Next week, um, the class is. Uh, I'm teaching the class, and it is the next chapter, chapter 22, which is Spirit. Amen. Uh, let's pray the Our Father, Hail Mary, and glory be. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And Jared has a few comments.